Hi everybody, one of the more interesting sorting algorithms that we have is counting sort. And there are a few things that make it quite impressive. First, it is really, really fast. It runs in linear time, which is a stark departure from other sorting algorithms we've looked at so far. It is stable. The relative order of items that you have in your unsorted version of where you're sorting is the same relative order that's maintained after everything has been sorted. And we don't talk about this a whole lot when we talk about many algorithms, but it's fairly easy to implement. When we look at how exactly counting sort works the way it does, we'll find that the translation from our conceptual knowledge to actual code to implement Implement it is not that far away. And so now let's take a step back and go deeper into how exactly counting sort works. So the sorting items we've seen so far, it's like quick sort and merge sort, they fall under a class of algorithms known as comparison based sorting algorithms. And they run in big O of n log n time. And that is still pretty fast. It's one of the fastest scores we can have. Now, when we think of a comparison based sorting algorithm, core to how it operates and how it sorts values is there's always going to be a step where you have a number and then you compare it to another number. Is this number bigger or less than? And depending on the output of that question, the sorting will take its own path depending on the algorithm that we're talking about. Counting sort is a part of a class of sorting algorithms that are not comparison based. They are integer based or non compare to based sorting algorithm. And what this means is that this approach is a little bit more unique compared to a sorting algorithm that we've seen that uses what is number is bigger or less than, but it does allow for really fast running time. You know, we said it's linear time, big O of N to be more specific, big O of N plus K. And we'll talk about what N and K are later to quantify in what situations that, that the linear time is completely valid. But what this does mean though, is that counting sort behaves and sorts values in a way that is very, very different than any other sorting item we've seen so far. And that's going to be a pretty interesting hurdle to cross when we think about how sorting numbers typically has worked. So definitely we will dive into those little quirks as part of our look into counting sort. Now, before I go further, I should definitely know that if you want a friendly yet comprehensive look into data structures and algorithms like counting sort and so many other sorts, my best selling book, Algorithms, Absolute Beginner's Guide is just for you need. So look for it pretty much in any bookstore, online or virtual, links to that below. Okay, let's get back to our deep dive into counting sort. To help make sense of how counting sort works, it's always great to start with an example. And so here we have our input array. And this input is unsorted. And our goal is to sort these values from smallest on the left to largest values on the right. Now, I'm going to explain at a very high level how counting sort works. And I fully recognize that what I'm about to say may not make a whole lot of sense right now, but just keep these words and phrases in the back of your mind. When we start looking at how exactly counting sort works, this paragraph will start to make a whole lot more sense. So counting sort works by counting uh, appropriately named counting the occurrences of each distinct element in the input array. And it uses this count information to determine the position of each element in the sorted output array. And what this means really is that we have a set of input. We're going to count how frequently each number appears. We're going to place those numbers in sequence and that numbers being placed in sequence will greatly influence what the final sorted value is. And remember, no comparisons are allowed in this sorting algorithm. And so we're going to be using the relative ordering of items in an array as a way of figuring out what the final sorted value should be. So let's start with each of the steps that go involved. And as we progressively go further and further, that previous statement of how counting sort works will make a whole lot more sense. So it's step zero, the very beginning of this. The input, the values that counting sort needs to sort have to be a very particular format. They had to be made up of positive numbers, zero and greater. And when I say number, I mean integers, so no decimals and so on. And the range between the smallest and largest number needs to be fairly small. It doesn't have to be, but if you want the ideal performance, the range between them needs to be fairly small. So in the same order of magnitude as the input size. So if we go back to our input, we can see that so far, all the numbers we see are integers. They're greater than zero. And the range of numbers seems to be fairly in the same ballpark. You know, the lowest number is zero, the highest number is seven, and we have like what, one, two, three, four, five, six, about 11 entries here. So, you know, we're pretty much in the same range of numbers as the size of our input. So now that we kind of said that our input is valid and a great candidate to be sorted with counting sort, let's go to step one. 
the first step we do is we find the maximum value, which in our case, it's the number seven, it's the largest value in our currently unsorted input of values. Easy, right? Which it is. Now we go to step two. So with step two, we create a count of all the values. And the way we do this, you know, is in a, we need to do this in a more of a scalable way. And the way that scalable way works is we create a new array called count. And, you know, under count array, of course, has index positions and keys. What's gonna happen though, is that the keys in our count array will represent each unique value from our input array. Now, I know that just sounds like, wait, what am I talking about here? Let's go slower into this one. We know the maximum value in our input array is seven. We calculated that in the previous step. And so when you create a count array, the highest key will have a value of seven as well. This means our array will look a little bit like this. But the key in an array is also known as the index position. And so the range of numbers goes from zero all the way to seven, you know, in our input. And so we create an array whose size is large enough to hold the key value or index position from zero all the way to seven. So here you have our count array. Right now, every value for it is, you know, is basically zero. But the more interesting part are the key value ranges. It goes from zero to seven. And so if we look at the size of the array in this case, it's always gonna be one greater than the largest value that we have. So we have an array size of eight, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this index position maps very nicely to the range of numbers we see in our input array in the first place. Now, all that remains is to go through our input array and count. It is a counting exercise, you know, counting sort is appropriately named because counting is a big part of how it operates. And so what we do now is as we go through each value in our input array, we find its appropriate entry in the count array and just increment its value by one. So in this case, for example, our first value is five. And when you go to index position five in our count array, we increment that value by one. Next, we have in the, the value two is in our input. This value is the index position to count. And so we go to the second position, you know, index position two in count and increment that value by one. And we know that there are two values of two, which is why the value is two. As we go through the full array in our input, we'll be able to create a, a the count of every value and how frequently it, it appears. So you can see that the value zero appears twice, the value one appears twice, two, three, two appears twice, three appears once, and so on. This helps create a representation of the frequency that each number in our input array actually appears. And a detail to pay attention to is that because index positions start from zero and then go all the way up to the maximum value in sequential order, you can sort of see that the initial ordering of my items is already starting to sort of take shape where we know that there's one seven value and zero six value and they're all in sequential order. And that's gonna play a big role in step three when it comes to calculating the final position. Now, we're not done with our count array yet. The, what we wanna do though is evolve our count array to better describe the sorted position each item will ultimately be in. And we do that by calculating what's known as the cumulative sum or prefix sum at each array position. Now, if you've never heard the phrase prefix sum or cumulative sum before, it is a fancy way of saying, we look at each array item starting at the second index position or index position one, the second position, and adding its value to the value in the previous array item. So we just create this like sequence that accumulates from the first number all to the second number, which is a running tally of the values. So if you look at what this means, we have our count array as it is right now, where it just shows the frequency that each number represented by the key value appears. And what we do is just we add the, the preceding value into the next value and, and store that value as a result. So we know that, for example, the value at zero is two, the value at index position one is two, and because we saw the second number, we just add the value from zero index position zero to index position one and store the sum in index position one. That's probably more complicated, but if you see the visualization, you can see it right here. Two plus two is four. So at index position one, we have four. And then from four plus two is six. So you can see six is being stored here. Six plus one is seven. Seven plus two is nine. Nine plus one is 10. 10 plus zero is still 10. And then 10 plus one is 11. You can see that the numbers, the cumulative sum, gradually increases as we go from left all the way to right, taking into account the value stored by each cell, your current or cell or array position that you're trying to calculate the value for. 
And so now we this what this helps with is in helping cut the final position. You know, I'm kind of jumping ahead here just to give you a hint, but you can kind of tell that if each value in our count array now specifies the frequency the number is going to appear in, you can see that zero is going to appear twice. You know, zero and one get taken up. Number one is four. There are two spots for that one. So you can see four is going to be taken up by two and three. Six is being taken up by two as well. Seven is one. Nine is two. Ten, there are no values for it beyond just one of it. And then 11, there's one. And this, there's a more formal way of doing this. And I'll explain why there's a formal way of doing this. And that's going to be in the last step. Step four, actually placing the elements. So what we're gonna do here is take our unsorted elements from the input array, map them with the locations we calculated in our count array in the previous step, and fill our output array with the correct values in their sorted locations. Now, this is going to look like it has many small steps and it might even seem a little bit confusing, but as we go through each of the steps for some of the values, it'll start to register. You'll see a pattern start to emerge. So our input array will be the primary driver of the remaining steps you're about to see. And we'll be iterating through all the values in our input array in reverse. We're starting with the two on the right and going left. And the reason for it is to maintain stability. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So here's a starting point, it's number two. So what do we do here? We know that the value is two in our input array. It's the first item at the very end. We then go to the corresponding entry in count, which is index position two. And we go there and we see the value stored there is six. And so what we do is that that value of six maps to the index position in our final output array. And the index position is going to be one less than where the value that is stored right here. That means our index position is going to be five. We take six, we subtract one, and we say it is five. And at this moment, all we do is we plop our two into index position five. Now we're not done just yet. What we're going to do next is the count value that we just used, you know, index position two, value of six, we decrement that value by one. And we say that value is now five. And six minus one is five. And the reason we do that is, should we encounter another two value at any point in our input array, we wanna make sure that we don't go back and override the same value again, because we kept it at six, the previous step we just apply, we just overwrite the existing value that we have. So by decreasing the value of count, we're creating a running log of where the last item was and where the next item should go. It's kind of like we're overloading the count array by the prefix sum to also be storing the position of where the final values should be. Now let's go to the next value we need to sort. Continuing from our input array going backwards, it's going to be seven. And let's go a little faster here because we kind of walked through what happens. So the value seven, the index position of seven in our count array is the last item. And that has a value originally of 11. And then what we do is that we know that the index position and output is going to be one less than that. So 11 minus one is 10. So in our output array at index position 10, we place the value of seven. And before we wrap this up, we reduce the count value in index position seven from 11 down to 10 as well, just to account for we've already used one value from this location. And if you go to the next value, four, at index position four, the value is, I believe, nine. And then when we go to the index position and count, our output is going to be at index position eight. So we place the four there, and then we decrement the value stored in the count array for index position four to be eight as well. So that we take care of that. Zero, kind of very similar path here. At index position zero in count, the value is two. We go ahead and place it at index position one. We place a zero here. Now two minus one is one. Index position one is now zero. And this is actually a great example of why we decrement the value in count, for example, from two to one. The next value we're gonna encounter also happens to be zero. And in this case, when we go back to count array index position zero, the values there, the value that we see there is actually one, which means the index position is one minus one is zero, and the output at index position zero is now also going to be zero. And this is a great example where if we did not decrement the value of count, what we would still see here would be a count value of two, and the next zero will just overwrite the zero we had earlier, which means that we would be missing a zero instance. So by decrementing it, we can more clearly see why we do that just so that we don't lose track of any of these items. Now, this process does not change. It just keeps going and going until we go to the beginning of our array and we have no more items left. 
And so if you follow this process throughout to the end, you will end up with the final output, which is going to be the sorted version of the items from our input. It's going to be 00, 11, 22, 34, 4, 5, and 7. Now, I mentioned earlier that we are counting backward. So by iterating backward in the original array, we ensure that the elements are the same value, are placed in the output array in the same order they appeared in the input array. And this is crucial for uh, something we talked about at the very, very beginning for maintaining stability. And so this means that, for example, we have two zeros, right? And you can see the two zeros are in this order. Because we're going backwards, we, we ensure that the first zero that we encounter backwards is appears in position index position one, and the second zero we encounter appears in index position zero. The relative order is maintained. And if we went forwards to the array, we cannot guarantee that we can do that. And so we don't gain much. So going backwards gets the stability without any extra added effort. So why not just iterate backwards and get the stability badge added to counting sort as well. So that's how counting sort works. And let's talk a little bit about the performance characteristics before we start to you know, talk about some of the remaining few pieces left before you can com consider yourself pretty much an expert at how counting sort works. At a very high level, the time complexity and space complexity for counting sort, it's all going to be big O of n plus k. And the, the detail that's very subtle here is the value of k is going to be very, very different depending on the input that we have. And so the reason is that the ideal performance, the range of values we need to sort needs to be on the same size as the total number of values in our input. We kind of flag this as a requirement for the input that we're dealing with. And we'll kind of talk about why that is the case right now. So let's go back to our input. And let's now describe our performance in terms of two values, our input array, which is the unsorted input, and then the count array, which contains the range of numbers that we're trying to sort as, their, as the key position. And so in this case, n is going to be our input, the length of the values in our input, the size of it is gonna be n, and then the range of values in count based on what the input is from zero to the maximum value will be the value of k. And so when we say the approximate counting source running time, we use the value of input and the size of the, you know, not value, the size of input and the size of count to make this determination. In the case where both n and k are approximately similar, big O of n plus k does result in a linear running time, you know, because they're both very similar. Now, a situation where they will not be very similar is one like this, where we have our input, it's 51, 2, 0, 99, 3, 40, 7, and 1.39 million. The value of n here would be 7, because we're only trying to sort 7 values. But k, k corresponds to a range of numbers in our input, which means that would be the going from 0 to the maximum value, which would be 1.39 million. And so if we had to visualize this in the count array, our count array would just go from 0, 1, 2, 3. And by, by nature of how arrays work, it'll also continue to create an array whose size is long enough to hold a key value of 1.39 million and 502. That means even though we have seven numbers, because the range of those numbers is very, very large, our count array will literally be massive. And so when we have this kind of situation, we'll see that big O of n plus k, k is ridiculously large relative to the size of our input. And this would be of a running time of big O of n to the seventh power. So really, really large. Similarly, if we look at the space characteristics, it's entirely based on the intermediate arrays we create. As we saw earlier, we have our input array, but we create a count array and we create our output array as well. And the count array is the one that's gonna be the most variable because input and output with the same exact length. If you're sorting 20 numbers, your output will be 20 numbers as well, but hopefully it'll be in sorted order, but doesn't matter though. For the amount of memory you need, is the amount of space for the intermediate arrays that you need to do. And so the counting sorts additional space is proportional to the size of the input array and the range of input values. And just like before, the amount of memory you might need, it's entirely dependent on the range of values we're trying to sort here. And so keeping that range very minimal where n and k are similar is the best way to make sure your space complexity also stays within the linear you know, bucket that is so ideal and what we seek in a great sorting algorithm. To learn more about how counting sort is implemented, it's hard to show all the code in video form. So the best way, just go to my article 
about counting sort on Krupa.com. Easiest way is just go to Google, search for Krupa counting sort, scroll down a bit. You'll see the lines of JavaScript needed to make it work. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, it is an easy to implement algorithm, even though explanation may seem to have required a lot of slides and a lot of hand waving, a little bit of math and things like that. It, you know, naturally the way JavaScript works and how programming languages work in general, those little operations we talked about are very easy to implement and are a core part of the programming language for most languages that you'll be dealing with. So you'll find that counting sort is actually only a few lines in the grand scheme of things. And so if we had to summarize, counting sort, it's pretty awesome, especially for we're sorting our positive integers with limited variability from the smallest and largest numbers. And there are many situations we can absolutely ensure that, you know, if you take, for example, you know, date of birth, the year people are born in, for the most part, that range isn't going to be very large. You're going to have someone born, born probably in the last, you know, worst case or largest case, 120, 130 years. I forget the oldest person in the world is right now, but the range is going to be at most from like people who are born just now, like today, so zero years old, all the way to like the oldest person, which you know, 110, 120, 130, and everyone, all, you know, many billion people on the planet will be within that particular range. So, you know, in that case, your value for K is going to be pretty small and your N value be fairly large but it'll be linear because you're sorting the same linear number of people within the a bucket of k and so data structures and sorting algorithms like counting sort they have a lot of little things you might have some questions about and the best way to learn is just to ask on the forums at forum.group.com where i and others would be happy to help you out and of course before i like wrap this up i'd like to give you a quick access to other ways of keeping in touch with the content i create the best way to learn more about videos is to like comment and subscribe on this video sign up for the news better to get bite-sized updates in your inbox of various things that I'm interested in that I want to share with you all. And for much smaller updates, more in real time, follow me at Karupa on Twitter or X as they call it these days and various other social networks where at Karupa is referring to me. And lastly, I have other books that I create beyond just the one for data structures and algorithms that you may find pretty interesting as well. Link below for all of them. All of them again available in both physical bookstores as well as online in Kindle and other ebook formats. And with that, I will see you all next time.